What's up, uh, Penguins? So, part two of the review, um, now that I've got the student who's taking their test into their classroom, which we're still virtual, so they're just on their computer doing their virtual stuff. Um, so, I will finish up and go over the free responses that I was planning on doing. Uh, again, sorry that I had to cut the last one short, and again, this whole thing is getting saved. Um, I just promised my students that I would do this so I wanted to make sure that I, you know, held my promise and I did the review session for my students. Um, so all I'm going to do is just do the two FRQs that I had planned. I've got one short FRQ and then I have um, a long FRQ to do. Uh, so that first FRQ we're going to do is the short one. Um, and so it is 2019 number five. Um, it says, researchers study evolutionary relationship among five primate species, obtain data from a sequence of mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, from a respective individual of each species. The researcher then calculated the percent divergence in the, um, in the sequences between each pair of primate species, table one. Um, and so you can see here, we got the human, the gorilla, the range tang, the gibbon, and the chimpanzee. And you can kind of see how they are related with each other. Okay, um, so the first question, is asking us, okay, well, based on the fossil data, um, it estimates that humans and the most closely related species is diverged probably 7 million years ago. Using the data, we need to calculate the rate of mitochondrial DNA divergence per million years between humans and the next closely related species. Well, so first thing you have to do is you need to figure out, well, who is the human most closely related to? So if you look at your chart, you see, okay, well, the human and the gorilla is 10.3. Okay, that's pretty close. Orangutan, eh, we're still good with gorilla. Gibbon is 18.1, eh, still good with the gorilla. But look, the chimpanzee is 8.8. .8. So I know, okay, well, the most closely related one is the chimpanzee. So I can go ahead and circle that. And since I'm trying to figure out the amount of divergence, which this is already in percent divergence, per million years, and you figure, well, how many million years ago was it? And so when you read the question, you can see, okay, well, right there it says it was in 7 million years. So the math that you're going to have to do is 8.8 .8 divided by 7, which gave you 1.257. Um, so the point could have either been um, 1.25 or 1.26, depending on how you calculate it. Um, so again, it's just simple looking at what they had. And this was a simple, like, you may never have had to calculate the percent divergence per million years, but you know how to do a ratio. And that's one of the, the components is can you figure out ratios? And so you had the percent divergence, you had the million of years, all you had to do was take one divided by the other to figure out what that ratio was. So the next thing you have to do is using that data, you're going to construct a cladogram um, on the template provided, which they give you a template. Um, I'm going to say that almost every time you see one of these free responses where you have to make a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram, they will give it to you. It has not been for a long time that they haven't given it to you. Okay, so we already established that the human and the chimpanzee were close together with each other um, because of the fact that they have 8.8 .8 between them. So we go ahead and we put the human and the chimpanzee up here. Notice that there's a branch point. That means these can rotate. You could have the chimpanzee here or the human here, or you could rotate and have a human and chimpanzee. It truthfully does not matter which way you do it. It can do either one and it's completely correct either way. Okay, so the next one that we have is we need to say, okay, well, Compared to the human, because it's pretty easy to use the human because it's the first line on our chart. Um, so compared to the human, how closely related is the orangutan, the gibbon, and the gorilla? Okay, so if you look, the next close one that you have is the gorilla. So you say, okay, well, after chimpanzee, the next one is the gorilla. And then if we look again, we say, okay, well, which one's the next number? Well, 16.1 is your next one because of the fact that the orangutan has 16.1, I would then put this orangutan last. And of course, the given was already there. So by process of elimination, we could have put the orangutan on there. But um, so we just did it based on um, descending order of which one was most closely related. So the chimpanzee was the closest related to the human, then the gorilla then the orangutan, then the gibbon, based on the data that they gave us, okay? Um, and so we had to provide reasoning for why the gibbon, this one, why was this place on the out group? Why was this place on this last branch here? Well, look at the gibbon. It has the most divergence from any of the others. Um, and so it's saying that the 
a given mitochondrial DNA is the least similar. It has the most different, it's the most divergent, demonstrating that you understand using this data that it is the most dissimilar. It does not share any of the traits with the others. Um, and so making sure you understand that and can verbalize that is where they were looking for that other point. Um, so now the fourth point, I think, in this question uh, was looking at, actually, this would be the third point because number five, five, six. No, it's the fourth point, sorry. Um, so the fourth point in this one was on the cladogram, draw a circle around the species that descended from where we have the indicated node. So here, they want to know well, which one, if this was a common ancestor, which ones diverged from it? Okay, and that's going to be your top three right here. Okay, I always think of it like driving down a road. Like right? you drive down the road and you can either turn here or you can keep going straight. You're driving down the road, you can either turn here or keep going straight. And so everywhere after that point in the road, every single organism after that point would have diverged from that ancestor. And so that would be your gorilla, your chimpanzee, and your human. And the good thing about this question was that if you didn't get your clitogram right, let's assume that you put the orangutan up in those top three, you could still get this second point because you recognize and you understand that those three came from that divergent point. Um, and so the points for the most part are not tied together, which I think is really helpful for some students um, in case you make an error accidentally, which is great. Um, so our next free response is a little harder of a question. And this one is a long free response, and so it's going to be a little hard for me to show you all of it at once. So I might just kind of summarize some of it just because for essence of time, because I still have the student taking their test, and I kind of should be paying attention to them. Um, so we are given this phylogenetic tree. Okay, and it's saying that um, we see our polar bears, they're adapted to life in cold climates around the North Pole. Uh, brown bears, black bears, and pandas are found in warmer environments. Researchers collected mitochondrial DNA from several bears and they made this tree. So this tree was made using phylogenetic um, data, okay, um, and looking at their, uh, their mitochondrial DNA. And then what they did is they looked at the certain gene, okay, this list gene. Okay, and so the list gene um, is a common gene in polar bears, brown bears, black bears, and panda bears. Um, and they looked at seven amino acid substitutions that is found only in polar bears. Those same mutations cause there to be a whitening, of pig an absence of pigmentation from hair and eyes. And if you've ever seen a polar bear, you know polar bears are, of course, white. Um, and so this now shows us our amino acid differences looking at that certain protein. So first part. Using that phylogenetic trait, estimate the age in hundreds of thousands of years. Notice the axis says hundreds of thousands of years. Look at me. Do not try to get fancy, okay? If they give it to you in hundreds of thousands of years, give it back to them in hundreds of thousands of years. Do not try to be fancy and convert anything. Just give it back to them how they gave it to you, okay? So don't be fancy. I'm looking at you. Don't be fancy. Okay, um, so they asked you per hundreds of thousands of years, which is on our axis, how long ago um, was the most recent ancestor of all the brown bears? And so if you look at all our brown bears, well, we have a brown bear here, a brown bear here, and a brown bear there. Okay, so the point, if you follow all of those roads back, that point where they come together is right here. Okay, so you say, okay, if I drop down to the axes from there, where am I at? Okay, so you would say that you're somewhere between... The 3 and 3.5, okay? So, <laughs> this question was fun writing. I was not on this question, but this one was a fun grade. So, they accepted anything that had the first two digits anywhere in the ballpark of 3, 0, and 3, and 5. So, as long as you were somewhere in the ballpark, you got credit. Because a lot of students were doing some crazy manipulation of the data and were getting crazy wrong numbers, but they understood that it was between that 3 and that 3.5. They understood that much. Um, and so they accepted anything from the three, 30 to 35 is what they took. As long as they had those two digits, they were happy and they were good to go. Um, so the second part we have to do is identify um, the population of brown bears to which polar bears are most closely related. Okay. So if I look here, I got my polar bears. And so we need to figure out well, what is most closely related to it. Well, if I look here, it branches right here to the European brown bear. So I can say, oh, well, the European brown bear is most closely related to the polar bear. Look how close they are. Look, they have a, this recent common ancestor. They share that recent common ancestor. So they're the most closely related. And the third point for this is identify two populations whose positions could be switched without affecting.
Sorry, I realized I paused because I'm running out of battery. We're, we're gonna, I hopefully will finish. This is the only question we're doing, so I should be fine before my battery dies. Um, so we're looking at that these ones can switch because of the fact that they share that branch point. So you could have said that we have the European brown bears and the polar bears, or you notice that these also share recent common ancestors, so these also can flip. Um, and so you could have also said that we had the Western North American bears and the Asian brown bears. Um, so as long as you named these two could switch or these two could switch, you would have gotten credit. Um, you didn't have to name them both. You just had to name one of the pairs. Um, so moving forward off A onto B. So now we have to construct another cladogram. And I chose this because of the fact that this one is a trip, tricky one. And I think I told you in the previous video that sometimes teachers do things wrong, right? We all make mistakes. I will be completely honest. When I did this for a response with my students, however long ago, three years ago when this question came out, I did it wrong. I went too fast with the question and I did it wrong. So I'm, you know, we're all human. We make mistakes. Um, so Construct a cladogram on the template to represent a model of evolution relatedness among the bear species based on the differences in the list protein sequences. Okay, so using the protein sequences, we now have to figure out where to put them. Well, if we look here, we can say, okay, well, the black bear and the brown bear have one difference. So, of course, I'm going to put them together on my cladogram. And again, these two can rotate. So, it doesn't matter which you put where. You can put black and brown. You can put brown and black. It truthfully does not matter. Okay. So, now if we look here, where's our next closest? So, if we look at the brown bear and the black bear, which one's next closely related? So, you can either say that the panda has 33 and 34 to the black bear, or you can notice that the polar has 7 and 8. So if you do that, you say, okay, well, here we go. Seven and eight. That means that our polar bear is next closely related. And last but not least, because it's 33 and 34 from the black bear, the panda bear is last. And my students had to do a huge long analysis um, looking at blast data to determine that the polar bears were not actually bears. I'm sorry, that the panda bears are not actually bears. They're related to the raccoons and a lot of other things that you didn't realize they were closely related to. They're actually not bears. Pandas are not bears. They're kind of more related to the red panda and the raccoon kind of world, which is kind of crazy that we put the name bear after them, but that's okay. Uh, so the next thing you had to do was circle the position that represents your outgroup. Well, your outgroup is going to be the one, oh, I didn't flip the camera. I'm sorry. Uh, is the one that doesn't kind of share the trace with the other. It's the most distant. It has the most differences. It doesn't share the commonality. So the one that comes off first. Um, and so that would be, of course, our panda bear. And as I said before, these points were not isolated. I mean, we're not connected. So if you put the panda bear there, you could still get credit as long as you circled that last branch, you would get credit for that one because you recognize that you understood that this is where the outgroup would be if I had drawn it correctly. Um, so last, the part C, student claims mitochondrial DNA is more accurate than looking at protein data. Well, of course, we know that mitochondrial DNA is more accurate because number one, mitochondrial DNA is looking at the actual nucleotides and you could have changes in the nucleotides that will not appear in the actual um, protein. So that's one reason. Another thing, mitochondrial DNA has multiple genes versus we're just looking at one gene when we look at the list protein. Um, and so they wanted you to uh, basically give reasoning to support the claim that the mitochondrial was more um, accurate than the protein. Now, again, that you're going to see this support a claim a lot. They're going to tell you the claim that the researcher had, and you have to be able to pick out information or determine stuff from your own knowledge to prove or support that claim that was made. Um, and so the options you could have said were that uh, genes have more variability than proteins. Um, mitochondrial genome contains multiple genes versus the list is one gene. Um, and then you could have also mentioned that the phenotype was associated under a strong selection. Um, must have been said in the prompt that I didn't read to y'all. So part D, there's a researcher that engineers a mouse by deleting a certain gene, the list gene, and replacing it with the polar bear list gene. Um, so they want you to predict what's going to happen. Well, we know when the list gene is in a polar bear that it makes the bear white. Um, so you can make the same 
idea that you would predict, you would outward that whole thought process that, well, since the polar bear with the list gene is white, we're going to find that the mouse is going to have reduction in its pigmentation and it's going to also be white. Um, so you could have said that. And then the reasoning would be because we just mentioned with the polar bear. I find that I always give my justifications before I give my predictions. That's just the way my brain works because um, I'm writing as I'm thinking because of there's just so many thoughts going on in my head as I write these free responses or as I write them as a, a student. I don't know if your teachers do it, but I write all the free responses that I ask my students to write because I want to see how long should it take, what's the error that you would make, and I want to make sure that I'm not perfect because I'm not perfect. There's some things that I don't know. So um, I do write the free response just like my students. Anyway, so uh, when I wrote this question, I don't remember what I was going with this, but whatever. Oh, yeah, I do the justifications before I give the actual predictions. Uh, so for part E, our very last one, which was what I don't believe is the best one in the world, but that's okay. Um, they told you, this was this, this was part of the prop. I brought it down because of the part that's in it. So what you have to do is you describe how the mutation, um, became common in polar bears, which isn't super hard because we know that it's going to cause them to be, you know, white and they live in a snowy area. So we should all know, of course, natural selection that because the polar bear can blend into its surroundings, it's less likely to be preyed upon. And because it's less likely to be preyed upon, it's more likely to survive, more likely to reproduce, and leave more offspring. So you would see over time, there'll be an increase in the, the white allele or this list allele, um, which is the absence of pigmentation. And so the part that I didn't like about this question was the second part. If you had uh, predict the percentage of white offspring that would be produced from mating a polar bear with a brown bear. And so I, along with many of the country, decided that that meant that the brown bear must have been heterozygous because they're brown. So I said 50%. And then I also argued and said, oh, it's 0%. And I went through this whole argument because you don't know what the brown bear is. You know what? This thing's stupid. And they said that that list allele is only found in polar bears, okay? So when you're reading these questions, okay, go back and reread them again. Read your prompt, read your prompt, read your prompt, okay? Make sure that what you think is actually what's been given to you, okay? Because the polar bear is the only one that can have that allele, which means that you're mating a homozygous dominant with a homozygous recessive. That offspring is at no way to be white. It will be a brown bear. So it is a 0% chance of getting a white offspring from it. Um, and so as I said before, natural selection, and then of course, 0%. So I hope that was helpful. And I'm sorry I had to cut my last video, but here was part two. And so I hope that it was helpful. And um, I hope you have a wonderful day and good luck to my penguins tomorrow on their tests. Bye y'all.